or pull out resource instruction um, or related services like speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, et cetera. Uh, about 907 of our students with autism in the district are sitting in ABA strain classrooms, the applied behavior analysis classrooms. Um, those are the classrooms where the teaching methodology centers around applied behavior analysis for the majority of the school day. And then there are about 169 students who find themselves in other classrooms that are special education, uh, substantially separate classrooms. Um, but they are not. Zach, can I ask you to please slow down? Yep. Sorry. I will slow down. It's okay. There's about 169 other students um, in our substantially separate other programs. So they might be receiving supports for a specific learning disability or an intellectual impairment um, because the primary need that they have does not stem uh, around uh, needing that applied behavior analytic instruction. In addition, I compiled just a little bit of national and local information for you just to show the trends around autism over time and some of the things that we track as a district. So I'm sure many of you are already aware of this, but autism rates have been rising according to the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, back in 2000, only one in 150 students uh, or children um, had carried a diagnosis of autism. And more recently in the 2018 numbers that came out, the numbers have risen to one in 44 children. Here in Boston Public Schools, uh, when we look at our student population, we have one in 27.8 students in our district enrolled um, have autism as a primary disability. And that's about 3.6% of the district. So a, a pretty large portion of our students are students with autism. In comparison to other districts throughout the state, you'll see that from 2008, when I first started tracking this data to now, um, all districts have been rising uh, in terms of students with autism as the primary disability uh, pretty similarly uh, across the past several years. Uh, what that tells us is that Boston is right in line with what Massachusetts looks like in terms of enrollment of students with autism in our district. One other point I always, always want to make sure I make when I'm speaking to parents about their rights through the IEP process is the seven areas that must be addressed in every IEP meeting for a student with autism. And so these items are required by law to be areas, areas that we consider in IEP meetings for every student with autism as a primary disability. The first is obviously their verbal and nonverbal communication needs. Second, the need to develop social interaction skills and proficiencies. Third, needs resulting from unusual responses to sensory experiences. Needs resulting from resistance to change and transitions. Needs resulting from engagement in repetitive activities or stereotyped movements. And I want to clarify that bullet does not necessarily mean reducing or eliminating those movements. It's about focusing on what needs the student might have in terms of accommodation and support. Needs for uh, positive behavioral intervention strategies and supports to address behavioral difficulties. Number six, the need for assistive technology. And the last, any other needs resulting from their disability that impacts progress in the general curriculum, including social and emotional development. So these are items in every single meeting for a student with autism that must be discussed. And this is good, a, a helpful thing for maybe you to have when you come into the meeting to make sure that while you're in the meeting, you're reviewing to make sure you feel like it's been adequately discussed by the team. And before I go into anything else, I just wanted to take a quick brief moment to talk about ableism. So by definition, de by definition, ableism is defined as discrimination or pre prejudice against individuals with disabilities. It has been a very, very important topic of conversation that has received a lot more attention in recent years. Um, and one of the biggest pieces of that conversation has been around the extent to which uh, we all need to adapt to support each other. And uh, the idea that, for example, 
teaching or requiring eye contact, right, for a person with autism is is likely inappropriate and can also be quite uncomfortable for the person. Um, and so when we're thinking about the supports that your child needs and crafting the IEP that your child needs, our primary motivation should not necessarily be making them like everyone else, right? The concern and focus of this work is about supporting your child with what they need to access a robust and meaningful instructional and educational experience in the Boston Public Schools. That does not mean uh, independently and unilaterally selecting targets for behavior change or skill development that do not align with your vision for your child and your motivations in conjunction with your work with your child. The work that we do should be in partnership with you and your children, not we've decided because we're the experts that that's what you need. You are an important member of the team and our schools and communities have an obligation to build an environment that is supportive of our students and what they need to be successful. That is our number one job. And that doesn't look the same for every student. That's why we have special education. All right, so my favorite slides as a behavior analyst, the applied behavior analysis slides. You'll get a lot more of this from another presenter later, so I'm gonna be fairly brief. So in short, 95 to 98% of everything that we do, including animals, is learned. Even things that are not learned happen for a reason, right? All the behaviors we engage in occur for some sort of a reason. Nothing ever happens for no reason. All learning follows basic rules for everyone. And if our kids can learn one set of behaviors, they can learn others the same way. And our job is to learn how they're learning and then tailor what we're teaching to that learning style. Behavior is communication. That's from where, the point from which we begin and in most cases where we end. For many of our students, the behaviors that they engage in, if they have more limited vocal communication skills, are the ways that they're communicating and self-advocating with us. And it may be the best way they have to let us know that something is wrong. When working to support our students with autism, our intervention should focus on building an environment that is supportive to their needs. In order for students to be available for learning, we have to create an environment in which they feel safe and supported. One of the most common questions I get in these talks is, does my student have to be in the ABA strand to receive ABA services? And the answer to that is no. We provide applied behavior analysis services in almost every school in the district. And the ones where we don't, it's simply because there's not currently a student there that has it in their IEP. So when you're going to your IEP meetings for your students, if you ask for applied behavior analysis support for your student and you are told by the school, oh, we don't do that here. You do have the right and power and ability to push back and say, nope, Zach told me I can still have my ABA evaluation no matter what school my child is in. We don't want students to have to go to certain schools in order to get ABA services. So we provide them in all, all settings across the district. That being said, our ABA strand schools exist in about 30 of our schools. So those are schools where we've worked very closely with the teachers and paraprofessionals to build a program where the teaching all day long is ABA teaching. So our teachers are trained ABA teachers, our paras are trained in implementing ABA practices, and on top of that, we have board certified behavior analysts in those buildings who support and, and uh, guide those services. In addition, we have one of my program directors for applied behavior analysis that are assigned to work in that building. They provide the supervision to the ABA specialists and they work with the teachers and the strand specialists. Hey, Zach, it's Tanisi. You have about five minutes left. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So this slide you may review later. I'm not gonna spend any more time on it because I wanna speak to the other stuff. Um, just remember that the applied behavior analysis team is here for you across the whole district. And I'll let the other presenter do the meat and potatoes of ABA. 
For uh, additional supports for our students with autism, we also have counseling and therapeutic interventions available. It is never required that any parent has to receive applied behavior analysis support. From our counseling department, they provide support with developing social stories, group counseling and supportive social skill development, individual counseling if the student needs it, and autism support groups. Um, some of the schools uh, actually have autism uh, social groups or clubs that they've got they've developed. Um, they may need to teach things like perspective taking, frustration tolerance, self regulation, coping skills, and social emotional learning skills. In addition, our school psychologists throughout the district support heavily with environmental modifications when needed. They look at things like consistent routines, previewing any changes, supporting visual schedules, making sure spaces are clear of clutter or distracting or uh, frustrating uh, environmental stimuli, uh, supporting the presence of a cool down corner or a sensory space in the classroom, designated space to safely regulate if a student needs that, transitions to and from the classroom, and checklists of expected behaviors to help students have a roadmap for what it is that's expected in different environments of them. In addition, this next set of slides focuses on sensory supports that are available in the Boston Public Schools. So first, I'm going to spend a quick second on defining what a sensory strategy might be. These are things that might be available in a classroom, um, like fidget tools, balls to sit on, exercise groups and movement breaks. They could be available to all students in the class, or they might be kept in break areas, or they might be specialized to an individual student. They could be uh, things like a sensory table, exercise groups and movement breaks, individual plans as needed based on assessment and administered by an occupational therapist. And they are not to be implemented as a consequent strategy or to de-escalate crisis behavior. So what that means is we're not to use them only when the student is upset. These strategies are supposed to be present all of the time and available to the students so that they're able to get what they need in order to safely and effectively access the environment around them. So some examples of different sensory strategies you might see might be developed by the OT and the student's teacher, might include a sensory diet or a weighted vest, even a brushing protocol. Might be a direct service that's provided by the occupational therapist, either inside or outside the classroom. And again, I'm just gonna say it probably 75 times, not to be implemented as a consequent strategy or to deescalate crisis behaviors. So this slide is a little meaty on content, um, but it goes into the do's and don'ts for sensory strategies. So you should use sensory strategies as a regularly scheduled break in the classroom schedule, um, dependent on the student's needs in consultation with the occupational therapist. Um, if the student has the ability to request their sensory supports, then you should continue to support the student to develop that self-advocacy and language around the use of their sensory supports and needs. If not, it's critical that the team work in conjunction with the speech therapist to teach the student to develop those functional requesting or self advocacy skills. The student should not ever be denied a sensory strategy if they are not able to request it. Sensory breaks are never earned. Sensory strategies are a tool, not something that is earned because students enjoy it. They need to be to learn uh, to use it in that way, right? It's something that's available and always utilized. It's not a reinforcement contingency, um, as you would often hear a behavior analyst potentially say. Uh, you would not use a sensory strategy right after a challenging behavior, and that's because we want to be mindful that we're not only adding them to the environment after that challenging incident, right? They should be proactively and thoughtfully available. One reason for that is that we don't want to teach our students that they have to go through a full on meltdown in order to get the adults around them to pay attention to the fact that they need these supports right we don't want to create a situation where our students believe that they have to um, engage in large volumes of emotion and behavior in order to get us to attend to the fact that they have an unmet need. So during a challenging behavior, that's not to say we would not have our sensory strategies available to the student. 
any strategy or support that was available to a student prior to them uh, becoming dysregulated should continue to be available to the student. Staff should not, however, make novel environments or strategies available for a student during a crisis, as this will likely reinforce challenging behavior and could confuse the student as to when resources are available and how they access them. So we're exactly. not trying to, yep. Yep, that's five minutes. Um, just, you can continue for a moment more, just you know, be mindful that we have the questions following your presentation as well. Yep, so just one last bullet. So sure. there's an example that goes with that. While dysregulated, you could ensure that a student has access to their Chewy, for example, for oral sensory stimulation. If that's been available to them all day, then it's not a challenge. What we wouldn't wanna do is to introduce that Chewy while the student is already in a highly escalated state, because A, that may not be what they need, and B, it is likely very confusing at that point in time because they're trying so hard to regulate themselves. And I think we're holding questions until the very end. Um, just, I, I think, right, are we doing 10 minutes of questions? No, let's start questions. There are some questions in the chat that you yeah. can pull from the chat, please. Okay. Yeah, so just... there's one question, Zach. It says, where can they find a list of ABA stream schools? Is it from their coast or? Um, so I generally, I that say- was put, That just, that link was put in. It's the website link for BPS that was put in the, the, um, the chat also. Okay, you guys, you heard that. So it's put in the chat. Roxy put it in the chat for you guys where you can uh, find out where you can find a list of the ABA stream schools. I don't know if you guys can, I mean, if you can interpret that for the interpreters. It's, it's also, inside. All right. It's also included in the parent resources I'll put in the chat right now um, so that everything is in one place, but it, it's Thanks. there too. <laughs> um, and I did see one note that it wasn't up to date. I can confirm that the ABA page is up to date because Miss Adele helped to point out that it wasn't and it just got updated. Earlier, there was a question about is ABA only for children with autism? No, that's something that I've spent my entire time in Boston helping people to understand. Um, and it is something I'm deeply committed to. Um, we actually have uh, several board certified behavior analysts who are full time working in our emotional impairment programs as well, um, as well as several other places. Uh, we do not require a diagnosis of autism in Boston public schools to be evaluated for applied behavior analysis support. That being said, in the medical world, in order to access applied behavior analysis, you must have a diagnosis of autism and that's just our insurance companies catching up with the rest of the world. Any other questions I'm trying Could to- Could you also through? speak, earlier there was a chat, I'm just pulling from the earlier chat. Earlier it was asked about the size of classrooms for um, one, it was it were ABA classrooms and for inclusion classrooms, the, the ratio in size. Yep. And then there was also another question. Oh my God, I'll have to look at the other one again. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, for our applied behavior analysis strain classrooms, the ratio is one teacher, two paraprofessionals and a maximum of 10 students from kindergarten up to uh, 22. Um, for the early childhood students, it is one teacher, two paraprofessionals and a maximum of nine students. We really try to stick really closely to that one to three student ratio. Um, and uh, most of the time our applied behavior analysis classrooms generally have four or five staff working in them because of the related services that the students also have available. And then for the inclusion settings, that varies quite a bit depending on the school. Um, the, the core unit would be no more than five or six students who are considered inclusion students in the classroom. Um, and then the ratio of students in the classroom could range from um, 12 in the younger grades um, up to, I think the maximum is 22, but don't quote me. Could be 26 in the high schools. And there was a question about this, is there a part of the IEP that discusses how children can, other children can interact um, socially, how um, children that may have autism prefer to be interacted with? So I, there are several places where that sort of information would live. Um, it could be in the accommodation section, depending on the impact uh, on the student, if it's an accommodation for them to access their environment. It also could belong in the methodology section for the way that we support the student. Um, I often 
use the additional information section for all of those uh, clarifying details that are uh, contextual about the student. And then also there's the parent concerns and the narratives at the beginning. Um, it really sort of depends on the student and where it makes sense to place it. But yes, there's, there's a lot of space to include what the student needs in terms of interactions from other people. Nice, Zach, we have two raised hands. I'm gonna call on one of them if they still have that question, if it wasn't already answered. Ms. LaRouge, your hands up. Did you have a question? You can go. Ms. LaRouge? Ms. LaRouge you're, you're muted if you're talking. Okay, let's move on and we should come back. Do we have um, Danielle Ryan Tierney? Your hands up, Danny, Danielle. Hi, thank members. you. Um, this Hi. is for Jack. Jack, can you tell me currently what the staffing situation is and um, it's specifically related to ABA? Yeah. So um, currently applied behavior analysis is experiencing sort of a, a nationwide shortage in addition to the, the shortage that, you know, all, all areas are experiencing across the board. Um, as it stands right now, we are uh, working to recruit and hire to fill all of our ABA positions across the district, but, as, but we are uh, both short internally and in our contracted providers. So um, our contract agencies, uh, it turns out that Boston Public Schools is probably the largest applied behavior analysis provider in the state of Massachusetts and maybe New England. Um, and uh, as a result, people are not able to be trained and onboarded fast enough to keep up with our demand. Um, so at, right now we are short of providers um, and we are actively working to recruit and onboard additional providers every single day. Zach, regardless of the shortage, also including before pandemic, there's a question about amount of ABA hours a child can get an in inclusion. Is there a cookie cutter number that our children are blocked at? Or what is the inclusion um, status for ABA hours? Yep. There is no magic formula. Um, we have students receiving as little as one hour a week of direct instruction up to students who receive 30 hours a week of direct instruction in applied behavior analysis. The guiding force for those determinations is based on our applied behavior analysis evaluation tool. Um, that identifies uh, students' need for direct instruction and skills across a, a number of categories um, and assesses the student's level of independence in the natural environment with using those skills. All right. Um, Roxy, I really want to you mind turn the question. I'm, I am as well, the chat. Any more questions so we can continue on the next presenter? All right, thank you all. I'll turn my screen share off. Thank you, Zach. That was great. All right, you guys, thank you for that. So uh, again, thank you, Zach. We have next uh, Michelle Chapwa. You're on. Thanks, Chinese. So, um, hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Chapwa, and I am a licensed uh, behavior analyst, and I have experience working in in-home ABA. I'm going to share my screen here with you. So today I'm, I'm presenting a very quick overview on a very small part of what applied behavior analysis is. And thanks to Zach, we got some um, beginning steps to that, but this can be a little guide or reference to you as a parent on some of the strategies that we use in ABA. The first thing is what is applied behavior analysis? Um, ABA is supporting people with learning new skills and reducing problem problem behaviors. The ABCs of behavior analysis. In, in behavior analysis, behavior analysts or professionals working in the field, even parents look at three parts of behavior. We look at the antecedent, what happens before the behavior, and these are the triggers that come before the behavior, or they can also be proactive strategies that we add to reduce behavior. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we kind of go along. But we also have um, another part of the antecedent strategies, which are setting events. And these are what I call our slow triggers. Those are like our daily things that we experience, like being tired, being sick, or being hungry, or you know, sometimes just having that bad day. I just don't feel like myself. The next um, part of the ABCs is the C. 
And those are the consequences. And that's what happens after a behavior occurs. And most of the time, this is what we talk about as the reinforcement. I think Zach kind of talked, talked a little bit about not wanting to provide sensory input after a child has had a meltdown because we don't want to reinforce that a meltdown is what gets them access to something that they really need. Um, and so that's the part of the consequences that we will talk about in a few slides later about reinforcing based on function um, and um, getting access to items. And then the behavior, the big part that we all want to talk about and the probably the most concerning part to everybody, um, I try not to describe this as a good or bad behavior um, because most of the time when people engage in behaviors, they're not doing it as will intent, especially children. Uh, kind of going back to speaking on Zach, Zach's presentation, that communication piece. Behavior is communication and we don't wanna look at it as being good or bad. So when I speak today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about things as being desired or undesired. So a desired behavior or a replacement behavior or an undesired behavior and um, looking at it as a problematic behavior. What makes behavior happen? So going back to the ABCs, we're looking at the consequences here. And consequences are usually escape or avoidance or obtaining or desired um, behavior, looking for something that they want to receive or to get. Most people um, have, or these are the two common functions for most people that are reinforcing behavior long-term. Another important part of ABA that we wanna look at is those triggers, triggers or those antecedents. And the most common ones that we pay attention to are demands, requests, transitions, interruptions. And the reason that we look at this is because it kind of helps us figure out where those behaviors might be occurring or what's causing those behaviors. They usually, um, they're usually something that we look at from environmental perspective as well. And then we kind of look at them all together with what triggers and then what causes. To see how things are laid out. So this is kind of a tool to look at um, how we would outline a problem behavior. So looking at setting events, antecedent events. So we have your A here, your B and your C. And then when we talked about the behavior, we, I told you that we have two types of behavior, desired behavior or the problem behavior. And then we also have these replacement behaviors. The nice thing about this model is it really looks at the perspective of it's okay for a child to make mistakes. It's an opportunity for learning. And this is where we... Michelle, you're frozen. Oh. Am I oh, back? There you yet? go. Get back. Sorry. Get back. Yeah. No um, Horizon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so the replacement behaviors here, um, we're looking at being able to accept those alternative behaviors. I put in a nice little um, example, and this is just for you to look at and reference, obviously, given our time um, here, we can't go through every step, but it's really cool to look at because it looks at all areas of those ABCs, but it also helps you look at how to make a plan. So as a team, or even as a parent, like going in and looking at your child's behaviors, these might be things that you want to show show that you want the child to learn or that you're, you're looking at, these are the things that I'm seeing that are working for my child from setting events or those proactive strategies. When we use the ABC behavior and the competing behavior model, we use these models to increase desired behaviors and decrease or prevent the problem behaviors. We use these models for both antecedent and consequence strategies. And it's really important because it captures all three of those ABC um, areas that we were looking at. So really, really nice summary. Prioritizing behaviors. And I know as a parent, that's a hard thing because 
those behaviors can be very, very difficult. But when we are working um, on behaviors, we have to look at prioritizing to the best of our ability. And we want to can't work on everything at once. It's stressful for you. It's stressful for the child if we're trying to work on too many things at one time. We also want to ensure that there's safety and safety for the people that are around, um, making sure that an individual isn't going to be removed from an environment because of their behavior. And then lastly, we want to make sure that the individual has prerequisite skills. So before we implement anything that's going to change a behavior or we have an expectation for a behavior, we want to make sure that that child has prerequisite skills or those skills that will get them there. And so we'll talk a little bit about teaching as well. And lastly, my favorite thing about when we're prioritizing behavior is really looking at the learner who knows best and that the behavior of the individual is the most reliable indicator on how things are going. And that's why it's so important to carefully and objectively look at behavioral problems through those eight. For proactive strategies, these are some strategies that you can kind of use and take home with you. When we want, we want first to make sure that we prevent behavior and we really set up the environment for safety first and stay calm and neutral in any type of behavioral situation. And I know that's hard sometimes, but it's one of the things that we really wanna think about. As parents and professionals, we want to identify or pick our battles. Um, know the ABCs before you start. So kind of knowing what causes those behaviors, where the behaviors are gonna happen, and those things that reinforce the behavior. Um, and then we also wanna make sure there's that skill set that they are able to engage in a desired behavior because they have the ability to do that, um, not just because we think that should happen. And know that mistakes are opportunities for learning um, in the natural environment, and that we're always trying to capture and contrive opportunities for new learning. And something I wanna hit a, hit a point on when we're working on building um, behaviors and replacement behaviors, that we always want to allow for higher levels of reinforcement. So we wanna make sure that we're doing a lot of what the child can do versus what the, the child or the individual that we're working can't do. Um, so we wanna have like an 80-20 focus, 80% 80 of the things the child can do and 20% of the things that we wanna work on. And that kind of goes back to that idea of prioritizing behaviors, really looking at the important part and the important pieces of prioritizing those behaviors. Um, also with our proactive strategies, we can also use things, and I think Zach touched a little bit on this in his slides too, using visual cues, reminders, um, giving choices. And if we kind of talked a little bit in control, the, the idea of control is giving choice that the child feels that they have more control of their environment and what they're going to be able to access. Michelle, you have a little under uh, five minutes, about 4.30. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. And then next, let's talk about reinforcement. We usually think of reinforcement as a reward or maybe even a bribe. Um, positive reinforcement is way more than those two things. It's individual because we all have our preferences of what we like and what we don't like. Um, when we look at positive reinforcement, it will increase behavior and sometimes it will increase behavior that we don't want to reinforce. And if we are using a reinforcer, it's important to know that if the behavior isn't improving, then the reward is not a reinforcer. Um, and that's a very good indicator uh, when we're looking at problem behaviors that if we think that's something we're using, is effective, it will make, we will see an improvement in behaviors. And then just some types of basic um, reinforcement. And of course, as adults, we have reinforcement in our life all the time. Feedback and praise for doing a good job. And a paycheck for going to work, that's positive reinforcement. So when working with individuals or kids, we wanna think about those types of reinforcements as well. Um, typically children with disabilities don't get a lot of praise and feedback because we tend to focus on the things that they can't do 
Um, so that's why ABA really does try to focus on the things that the child can do and reinforce them. So looking at things that we might use as reinforcers are our tokens, preferred toys, You went out again, Michelle. She'll be back soon. But there you go. You back? Am, am I good? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're out. Okay. So you're good. And sometimes we like snacks and treats. Everybody does. That's a primary thing. You obviously um, don't have to use sweets. It can be fun things. But sometimes a reinforcer can be a snack or a treat. But we always try to pair anytime we're using reinforcement. Always pair with feedback and always pair with breaks. How to identify reinforcers. So as parents, you probably know what your kids like. Um, you're with them every day. But as professionals or maybe someone who um, is in the field of ABA, we might not know what they like. And to identify those reinforcers is very important. And we also might want to know what reinforcers have a bigger impact. So everybody has reinforcers that are more, of a, more preferred than others, but you'll take if the only reinforcement that is available is something that you minimally dislike, you might still take it. So what we like to do is look at what those big reinforcers are and use them to our benefit when we're trying to get those really important, big desired behaviors. And then these are some ways that we would work in the ABA field to figure out what those reinforcers are, or even as a parent, maybe you want to know what is going on um, in other environments and you want to know what types of reinforcers are available. So ask, one is ask the individual and even a non-verbal individual, you can ask them using a choice board and providing choices for them. Um, see where the person's spending most of their free time. That's usually a very good indication on those items being reinforcers. And then positive, You went out again, Michelle. Should be coming back momentarily. There you go. You're back. Okay. Sorry, guys. I have no control of my internet here. <laughs> it happens. Um, yes, that. Uh, reinforce differently for big goals. Um, so we want to use, go back to when we identified our reinforcers, we want to use the bigger, better reward for the bigger, better behavior. And then reinforce for attempts with smaller rewards. It's okay if we have to prompt as a consequence and say, hey, this is behavior we want to see. Or, hey, remember, this is what we need you to do. Or model that behavior. And those are all consequences. You froze again. There you go. You're back. Michelle, can you try turning your camera off and presenting with it off to see if that'll stop the freezing? I can. Maybe the bandwidth will reduce. Yep, absolutely. We'll see if this helps. I'm almost through my slides, so we should be good. Um, okay. The last area is what can we, what does ABA teach? And ABA is not all about reducing behavior problems. It's also teaching replacement behaviors and teaching functional skills to children and adults. And we want to improve skills, not just get rid of them. Um, and these are some of the areas in which in-home ABA um, or ABA in general, you might see um, areas that we work in. So improving communication, increasing leisure and play skills, increasing self-care, increasing environmental dangers, um, lessening the severe emotional reactions. So teaching coping skills or teaching other alternative skills to some of those self-injury, screaming and tantrums, and also, um, looking at improving self-care. All right, so yeah, um, your time's up actually. Um, so I don't know if you're done or not, but- um, I just have one more slide. Is okay. the who is the, um, the kind of who, where, and how of ABA. Um, and it's just letting everybody know that when you are working specifically in the in-home or insurance-based um, programs, as uh, Zach had mentioned, it is a medical necessity and you do have to have a diagnosis of ASD. However, you can, there are other options and other ways to receive services, maybe through grants or through private pay where they will cover other intellectual disabilities, ADHD, OCD, 
or people that might have um, severe behavioral problems that need help need help with that reduction. Um, typically ages two through the lifespan is what um, ADA services are provided to. And I specifically am an expert in in-home, um, but you can get ADA services in-home, school, clinic, or even in the community. And typically in ADA in-home services, we go into the community and help with those um, problems. want to kind of figure out the who and where of those ABA sources, those are available to you as well. And that is it. All right, Shell, I don't see any hands raised. Let me know, uh, Lisa, if you see any hands raised, but I do have two questions from the chat, um, Michelle, for you. One was, uh, do you withhold reinforcers if the behavior you ask for isn't performed? Yes, the, 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 the answer to that is yes, but you can also provide a smaller reinforcement if the behavior is, is, not, is not the problematic behavior. So if we have a reinforcer and we're seeing that the problem behavior is there, we might not, we're not gonna Stop. give the reinforcement because it will reinforce that behavior. Nice, and then really quickly, um because I know we started late, but um, the next question I saw while you were presenting was the model that you were displaying is that it doesn't seem to ask what the child needs. It just asks how, how can we mold the child to do what the child's parents or teachers want? And I responded to that because then you, you presented with something that kind of answered that, but you can elaborate on that if you want. What was, so it was, we're trying to, oh, get what the child needs or what the child wants. So the idea too is, you know, I know that ABA kind of comes across and it has a bad rep reputation for making children act like maybe like robots or um, be perfect. But the idea behind ABA, if it is done correctly, is that we do take into consideration what the child needs and what they want through giving them choices, allowing for choices, looking for preferences and activities that they like, um, and kind of seeing where it says the learner knows best and we kind of take that approach so we know how it's going and it's, it's not working. The learner's letting us know that based on their behavior and their interactions. Right, and I think you, that, that question was prior to you saying, um, elaborating on the learning of best. And then lastly, just so we can have the last person to go, um, it says, can BPS help facilitate setting up in-home ABA services? Boston Public Schools, can they help with that? Do you Setting not know the up. answer to that? That would Zach be definitely know, yeah. a Zach question. <laughs> Sorry, right. guys, I have to forgive you. I started, multi oh, you have to forgive me. I started multitasking. What's the question? Can um, BPS uh, help with that um, initiation with the in-home ABA? Can they help with that process? Yeah, your name. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we, we put out information periodically that hopefully is making it to families. Um, but if you're struggling with navigating that process, I would just reach out directly to me. I'll put my email in the chat. Sweet. All right, Lisa, you're, you're up. Thank you so much, Michelle and Thank Zach. Thank you for having me. I appreciate me. you guys. Thank it you. Like Gilda has a Michelle, can you put your e contact information in the chat also? Uh, I can. It's also on my um, slides, too, if anybody would need it. Yep, we will be posting the slides, but just so that they can have it for the chat right now. Yep, oh. I can do that right now. Hello, there's one question. Um, Go ahead, Lisa. Have... Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, no, Hilda has a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm allowing her to unmute. Hilda. Buenas noches. Yo tengo mi hija que tiene 21 años y estoy esperando por el resultado final del IP. Pero ella solamente se le aprobó una hora al mes. ¿Qué, qué yo puedo, quiero saber primero, ¿qué yo puedo hacer para que le den más hora en, en, la, en la casa? Y si después que ella cumpla los 22 años, ella tiene derecho a recibir el ABA. Gracias. Okay. Do we have the Spanish? I, I understood some of it. I'm not like, you know. We do have a I, Spanish interpreter and that's who's expected. Yes. Okay. They got to come out of the room. Um, and I'm not exactly sure 
if they had heard the question. If Apparently the interpreter was speaking. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, are we waiting? Yeah, she said they were speaking. I, I didn't hear anything. Mm -mm. I, I would. Oh, no, I, I think the other speakers in the meeting might yeah, not. Right, the English, the Spanish interpreter just. Um, translated on this on this English channel. But thank you, Juan. I would encourage the parent to reach out to me directly. If the interpreter could direct her to my email, I can support. Okay, Lisa, you're you're up for you. Any more questions? Let me see. Sorry, okay. I don't see any more here. Hands Hi. raised. Go ahead, Lisa. Your last presenter. <laughs> for time. Um, next, we'll hear from Kalia um, Kennedy from Autistics Unmasked who will speak about specific supports for neurodiverse students and the collaborative and proactive solutions. Um, and um, Anne-Marie um, uh, Vaduva, um, who contributed to this presentation, will be available to answer questions in the chat related to collaborative and proactive solutions. I will be available to respond in the chat as well. Thank you. Hi, Kelly, are you all set to go? I, okay, um, give me a second so I can share my screen. Okay. Make sure I'm doing this right. Okay. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, let me try to get it full screen. Okay, I think I can minimize that, perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kylia Kennedy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Autistics Unmasked. We are a um, Massachusetts-based nonprofit, though we do um, service all of the U.S. Sorry, that's my daughter. Um, and so our presentation today, uh, we'll go ahead and get into it. Oh. Okay, uh, so the quick introduction on me, um, I'm an autistic ADHD -er, mom to a three year old lactation consultant and also an author. Um, I play a very active role as CEO of Autistics Unmasked. Um, I'm in everything from social media to research and education to policy policy making and outreach. Uh, these are just some of the faces of our team members. Uh, we are a team of very diverse autists. Uh, we center BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, voices, uh, making this a safe and intersectional space for autistic self-advocacy. So these are just some of the faces of our team. Um, and we are currently in the works of creating a um, course for an education for educators on the autistic neurotype, uh, which will also be adapted to um, education for parents and um, uh, guardians of autistic for the autistic neurotype. So this is the, the pilot course that we're doing um, at Roxbury Roots Montessori School here in Roxbury. Um, and uh, this is a kind of a little bit about the course. So it's designed um, by our education team to give early childhood, primary, middle, and high school educators a way uh, for them to better understand their autistic students and how they can best support them in the classroom environment. Um, our main goal with these courses is to shift the educator student dynamic from how can we stop the student's behavioral issues to what sensory needs does a this, does this student have um, that they're not being met. So we're focusing on providing proper sensory supports um, and a learning environment for students who are autistic or other, otherwise neurodivergent, uh, regardless of if they have any sort of IEP or 504. Um, in this course, we start with the basics, which is understanding the autistic neurotype, shifting the language from child with autism to autistic child, and removing um, harmful labels such as high functioning, low functioning, mild, moderate, severe, um, and just simply leaving it as autistic. Um, we give a brief history of the autistic neurotype as well as the harms of behavioral approaches, um, Autism Speaks and Hans Asperger. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me just interrupt. But can you just slow down a little bit, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, sure. And 
Afterwards, we debunk myths, um, we introduce affirming language, and we offer a starting point for classroom accommodations. Uh, a vital part of this section is the elaboration of the harm and trauma that behaviorist approaches can often cause, um, and instead offering safe and neurodivergent affirming practices that can be adapted into the classroom. And these are just a few of the highlights that are included in the course, um, giving information or education on things like stimming. Um, stimming is what has previously been called repetitive movements. And it's just basically how autistic people um, self-regulate their emotions and sensory input. It's a vital part of our being. Uh, we all do it. And um, it's so we kind of go into what that looks like, the different types of stimming um, and what you should do uh, if you see it happening, which is essentially nothing. Um, we also go into alternatives for seating methods. Um, seating charts are a great way to give autistic students stability that they often need, um, but we encourage employ or we encourage educators not to change them without notice, as a drastic change to routine can lead to something like a panic attack or a meltdown. Um, and we give um, ideas for all alternative seating options, such as yoga balls, milk crates, standing desks. Um, this can also help students who are very stimmy, who stim a lot, it helps them stay focused. It gives them something uh, to stim with while they're learning. Um, we also highlight things like uh, eye contact and speaking, making note of the fact that autistic people do not always make eye contact, um, and that can be for any number of reasons, and it doesn't mean that they aren't listening or are disinterested. Uh, we also talk about um, the different uh, types of ways that students can communicate with their teachers or their parents or family, um, noting that situational or total, mutis total mutism is very common in the autistic community, um, and it doesn't mean that the information isn't being processed, it's just being processed in a different way. So we try to introduce um, alternative methods such as AAC devices, which is an augmentative and alternative communication device, also picture books, hand signs, writing notes, things like that. Um, we also offer alternatives to speech, or not offer, but we um, encourage um, educators and family members to offer alternatives to speech therapy that um, give your students a way or your children a way to communicate without trying to um, coach them into speaking. So again, the AAC device, picture books. Um, if they're older kids, it could be the text to talk feature on their mobile devices, something that I use frequently as I do experience um, situational mutism pretty frequently. Um, and, and trying to encourage them to refrain from in encouraging uh, parents and educators to refrain from using things, using situations or um, phrases such as use your words or where's your big kid voice, things like that. Um, we also encourage these uh, sensory friendly environments, um, trying to adjust lighting, uh, sounds, having a sensory free or friendly zone for them with uh, comfy chairs and the option for noise canceling headphones, anything that can kind of help them to decompress throughout the day when sensory input might be at kind of their, their limit um, to prevent any sort of meltdown, mm -hmm. which is typically the behavior that parents are trying to um, coach their children out of. It's all, the base of it is all sensory overload. Um, and also encourage things such as uh, just breaks in general to provide burnout. Um, even with the best accommodations, school is still somewhat uh, troublesome. And so especially for neurodivergent students, it's important to allow them to have breaks, even if that means, again, going to a sensory friendly environment, a place where they can stim freely, um, a place for them to read, take a nap, something of that nature so that they can really decompress and not have to worry about um, further getting further into burnout. And some of the things that we are working on at AU, so coming soon, as I talked about just now, the educational courses to help parents and educators support the autistic people in their lives. You learn about things like identity first language, the history of behaviorist mm -hmm. approaches and the therapies from the perspective of the actually autistic community. Um, we talk about autistic characters in media, we make it fun for them, uh, things like sensory supports and, and more accommodations for autistic people. We're also- uh, Mm -hmm. I just, I don't, it's important information and I want to make sure our, our families can all access it. Um, our interpreters are not able to follow your speed. Okay. So they just focus on trying to slow down, even double what you were slowing down before. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, and the next thing that we're working on is eMERGE. Um, this is 
essentially a one-stop shop resource for autistic children, parents, teachers, um, as well as the people in their lives to assist them with things such as independent or assisted housing, job readiness and placement, parent readiness classes, and a lot more. Um, we're also working on a mentorship program where older um, or um, longer diagnosed autists will be able to be paired with young or newly diagnosed autists to help them navigate this discovery of their, um, their diagnosis, explore what stimming feels like for them, um, as well as sensory supports and give them a sense of community. We're also um, creating a list of resources on our website for um, autistic medical professionals, therapists, creatives, um, so that you, your, your child or your student can be supported with other autistic adults who know them better than anybody else. And this part of the presentation uh, was done, was um, put together uh, by Anne Marie, a Boston education advocate. So I'm gonna read um, what she has put together for us. Um, and this is about the collaborative and proactive solutions. Uh, the CPS model is an inclusive approach to behavioral challenges at school and at home. My core belief is that kids do well when they can. The goal of collaborative and proactive solutions model is to work with a child to investigate which demands they are having difficulty meeting and what skills they are needing help with. Um, through a collaborative process with uh, the child and caretaker or teacher, a plan is developed. This plan helps both the child and the caregiver meet their goals. At the same time, the child is learning new cognitive skills to meet those goals. Um, solved problems don't cause concerning behaviors, only unsolved problems do. Uh, consequences don't teach lagging cognitive skills or investigate and address behaviors that arise from challenges of a sensory origin. And when people have an underdeveloped um, cognitive skills around flexibility, frustration, tolerance, emotion, regulation, and problem solving, it leads to challenging behaviors. The challenge Sorry, Kali, you just have under five minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the challenging behaviors are a way for people to indicate non-verbally that their that their expectations or demands um, that they are having trouble or difficulty meeting. In the CPS model, demands are uh, causing the challenging behaviors are called unsolved problems. These problems are identified with helping of the child. And through this process, the skills are that are lagging are also identified and targeted for development. The emphasis of the CPS model isn't on modifying the concerning behavior or imposing consequences or changing the behavior by offering rewards. The presumption is that the kids cannot meet those expectations and that they don't want to. Uh, there are a number of helpful resources. Um, uh, this book here, Ross Green wrote a book entitled The Explo Explosive Child. Um, that was the origin of the CPS approach. And Stuart Albon, wrote, um, who wrote with Ross Green, also created a program called uh, Think Kids at Mass General Hospital that uses his approach of solving uh, problems with the children. So there's a link there for that. I'm not sure if um, Lisa has these links that she can put them in the chat. Um, and Think Kids are, provides training for uh, NCPS for Massachusetts school, including Boston Public Schools, uh, the Elliott K-8 Innovation School and the Manning Elementary School. Also Massachusetts CPS providers can work with individual children. There's another link there um, if you have that Lisa to put in the chat for them. Uh, Ross Green was affiliated with Mass General Hospital while developing CPS. Uh, he found the organization lives in the balance. The two entities teach the same concept under slightly different names with their own approach. And the parent resources included with this event are listed in number of li lives in the balance uh, resources. They include a parent Facebook group um, with one version in Spanish and one version in English, a training video, uh, in information in multiple languages, trainings, and a software app called Lens Changer. Uh, supports for your child. So if you're interested in uh, the Autistics on Mass course, Autistic Neurotype for uh, Education for Educators, or the Collaborative uh, Proactive Solutions, you can ask your child's school um, for this as part of their IEP process. 
and uh, parent resources were compiled for this event related to the presentations and um, share to share additional resources. So the link again, um, Lisa, if you have that should be in the chat. And that is it. Let me see if I can get out of there. Okay, yes. okay. sweet. We have time left as well. Um, no. um, so if you guys have any questions, thank you, Kalia. Sorry, Lisa, go ahead. I don't know why I just took over for you. <laughs> go ahead, Lisa. Uh, Lisa? Oh, um, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? Um, you guys are doing pretty well with answering. I'm Anne Marie was monitoring the chat. Um, I see that. I know I have a question. Um, nobody's hands raised. One minute, Kalia and Anne Marie. I took a photo of a question. Um, bear with me. Um, I don't know if we have the Spanish interpreter. I'll read it in Spanish. Um, to me, it's saying, let me just read it. It says, Yo tengo una pregunta. Me gustan. Basically, they want to know. Is, um, Yashi yeah. is helping that parent because she's asking. Okay, so we're all set with that. Time. All right, all right. So we're in that. Anyway, so the next one, good job, Roxy. Thank you. Um, and that was the only question that I followed. Roxy, did you see anything in the chat? I know you're monitoring it as well as Anne Marie for us. One person asked um when the program will roll out. Yeah, um, so we are we just finished the first draft of it. Um, we're kind of trying to um, do the pilot of it with Roxbury Roots Montessori by the end of this school year. So we're hoping that by the beginning of next school year, we'll be able to roll that class out for um, any any public school or private school that wants to take it. Excellent. Nice. So to answer your question, Ty, I'm not actively monitoring the chat because I expect you and Lisa to be doing that. Roxy, you're breaking but up. I, I can provide you're breaking backup. up. I no, no, we're good. Backup. I just, that's fine. We got it. I just know. One of the questions that was yeah. at the top of it was, are there any places where families can sign up to ensure that they can find out all things ABA? So if there's a mail list, Zach, or any of the <clears throat> presenters, where families can also just keep in touch about as far as anything going on with ABA or any programming. I think Julie, when she put in this, asking about anything ABA related via BPS. Is there a sign up that they could be part of? Sorry, you caught me multitasking again, but I heard the question the second time. I apologize. <laughs> that is I'm not a very good multitasker, in case you haven't noticed. Um, yeah, in terms of a mailing list, I typically distribute everything through the coordinators of special education so that it gets to all of our students across the district. Um, I don't have like a specific, here's all the ABA stuff sign up list, but that's an excellent suggestion. I will try to find a way to create it and communicate it to SPEDPAC. Zach, can you, that. Hey, Zach, this is Charlie. Can you clarify a little bit? You just stated that all resources, you disseminate them to the coordinator of special education, and then they're supposed to, they're supposed to get that information out to the parents, correct? Right, correct. Okay. I send it what out happens? To what happens when there is no coast and right now you have a shortage of coast and there are parents that do not have coast support. So what is the mitigating control that these parents are going to get the communication? So typically there's a compliance coast assigned to those schools, even if it's only for uh, a few days a week, they would be the people who would be uh, getting those out. Um, that's typically the, supposed to be the mitigating force. Um, I can certainly talk to Heather about other strategies we can use to employ when we're communicating out to families where schools have coordinators that are on leave or that they're uh, vacant or absent. Okay, because the reason why I'm asking this is that we get a lot of feedback that parents are not receiving communications. And okay. if, if the protocol is that parents are receiving it through the COSAs and we're getting feedback that they're not receiving information from their COSA, that there is no COSA, I probably this procedure should be reviewed so that parents get the information and that they shouldn't have to come to a sped pack meeting and ask hey where is this information and this, sh this shouldn't be the first place that that you hear that they're not getting the information absolutely thank you charlie uh joshi and i'll bring that back to the team and uh try to improve our processes to make sure communication is more effectively getting to the parents thank you Zach, Zach, i just wanted you to add speak to what about if there are any students that 
that should be getting ABA that are not? Um, for Danielle's question, she's basically asking, with the shortage, is it that, that is being streamlined so that it's spread among students or there's some who are getting zero hours, basically? So at this point in time, I believe uh, we are up to all schools having some level of service. There were several months at the beginning of the school year where there were some schools that were not yet receiving services. Um, I would have to go through my list uh, for the most recent update. Last, last I was certain, certain, there were two schools left that had, I think, one student at one school and two at the others. I believe that those are all resolved. Um, there are still some, there are still, I would say actually many students who are receiving partial services, um, but we are working to distribute the services across all students as equitably as we possibly can. Zach, just, just in light of time here, it's, it's almost 8.30 here. We have a couple of hands raised. Um, and thank you, Zach, I appreciate you. Um, go, go ahead, Lisa, I see your hand, you raise your hand too. Yeah, I just had a, a simple question. I was curious, like how many of the people that are part of the organization are Massachusetts based and um, like in the, you know, Boston area? Is that for me, Lisa? At, at yeah. 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 So um, right now it's just myself and uh, my sister, who is our other co-founder and creative director. Um, we are the only two here in Massachusetts. The rest of us are scattered across the U.S. We even have um, a staff member who is overseas in the U.K. So we're pretty. Uh, we have a pretty broad reach. Interesting. Thank you. Um, and I did see that someone in the chat had a question um, if any resources for individuals, not just for the school when it rolls out. Um, yes, these courses are going to be adapted to not just schools, but also uh, family members, parents, guardians, uh, friends, and autistic people themselves. So the course all around is, is going to be modified. Um, also employers, um, and we're hoping to eventually roll it out to people like first responders, doctors, um, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome, thank you. Great job, Kalia. Guys, in, in lieu of the, the, the time, um, I just wanted to add, I, I wanted to add it before you guys were asking about the kids who haven't received ABA and so on and so forth and BPS. Um, if you ever have a question and you don't have a, a, a current coast coordinator of special education in your school, you can always reach out to the headmaster slash principal and they can kind of give you some information that can you know, lead you or, or point you in the right direction. That, that's all, also helpful for those parents who don't have a, a course in the school. Um, um, I have a question for Kalia. Uh, sure, go ahead, honey. This is Anne Marie. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kalia, for your presentation and also for presenting what I, what Lisa and I put together. Um, uh, so my question is, I, I really like love, you know, what is, what is gonna be happening, this rollout of this course and, I'm just wondering if you've had an opportunity to uh, partner in any way with BPS, um, because sometimes I know as a parent, uh, I've spoken to my school team um, about, you know, training in, uh, for example, collaborative and proactive solutions, et cetera, just training for my child's educator. And I've had, uh, you know, um, at the time, it just, there didn't seem to be capacity for that, for the, for the teachers. And then I later got advice that I should just keep asking for it through writing. I was just wondering if you've been able to, to reach out to BPS about integrating what you're planning to bring to the table to help autistics, um, you know, in, in, a, in a way in which it can be adopted in, in the BPS school system. So we haven't had a chance to reach out directly to any school districts yet. Um, the course was, the first draft was just created and sent to me this morning, like literally just this morning. So uh, we're still working on the curriculum outline to be able to um, present to school districts so that they can decide if they want to take part in it or not. Um, ultimately, it will kind of be up to the teachers who are, or the um, parents rather, who are part of uh, individual um, SPED pack programs to to talk to their school and say, hey, I found this organization that has this course um, and try to work with other parents to see if you can uh, petition to get our course in, in implemented at whichever school it is uh, that you're looking to have it implemented at. I, I, just, want okay, to, great. I just want to make one note <laughs> um, that with the parent resources, I can update them at any time. So if you have some updates on like what's happening with your organization, I can put it in there and that way people 
can have the most up-to-date information. Perfect. Yep. I can absolutely do that for you. Um, and I talk, I'll talk to our head of education and see what she's got for me. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. If we don't have any more questions, let me know if you have questions. Um, if obviously, if you can put your information, I think you already done it or Anne Marie has done it. You guys are doing great with the chat. Um, put your information in the, uh, the chat for people to look you guys up, reach you if they have any further questions. Uh, additionally, you guys, numbers, contacts, so on and so forth. Um, without any further ado, you guys are free. Thank you for joining us, Boston Sped Pack, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. I appreciate you guys. Um, you can email Boston Sped Pack, uh, Boston S P E C P A C 411 at gmail.com. I appreciate you guys.